So uh, I didn't want to have a huge picture of my face up there, kind of like 1984, so I, I took a picture of my work uniform. So uh, for those of you who uh, started today early, uh, thanks for, for holding off your lunch a little bit longer. Um, for those of you who are just rolling in uh, from your room, um, good job last night. So uh, I'm a long time security person. Uh, I've been in the industry a while. Um, but I'm also a huge Linux geek, which really made me excited about Docker when I first saw it. Um, I also recently wrote a, and released a pretty big white paper um, that, that somebody uh, fairly aptly named the, the War and Peace on Container Security. But, and I'm not a developer. Uh, I know that you know, uh, a lot of the people in this room are probably much better at writing code than I am. Uh, and uh, the way I like to describe it is, you know, I, I like make bad things happen to good software. So before we get started, I kind of wanted to have this disclaimer that says that really, you know, microservices are not for everybody. Uh, if you're a startup, they, they might be a way to, to go to move towards, but they're probably not the right way to kind of get going uh, because really they can be hard. Uh, they're, they're, you know, uh, I'm not up here to make it sound easy. Um, and part of why they're hard is because I think they take the complexity of a, a monolithic app and kind of all the different uh, code that goes involved with that and supporting services, and they kind of scatter that across uh, a, a much larger uh, range. Um, whereas each individual piece is more simple, but really the overall complexity hasn't really changed. Uh, and in some ways it may have even gone up. So you want to build a microservice. It might look something like this when you're done. Uh, but I think that uh, at the end of the day, this is probably a good thing. And hopefully, uh, as you go through my talk, you'll, you'll kind of see why. So we've seen microservices before, right? The, the Unix model of building a very simple process, uh, a, a very simple command or operation, and then connecting those simple things together with a common mechanism to create something much more powerful, right? Shell scripting is awesome. You can also see this in nature, right? We see lots of, of things, uh, engineering, emulating uh, evolution. And here, you know, we can kind of see that you know, bees and ants and other things like that are very simple uh, individually, but create something much more powerful. You also see this in a, a modern vehicles, right? So a modern, modern car has a CAN network that connects all kinds of very specific individual ECU units that talk a common platform. And really, automotive OEMs know a lot about failure modes, testing, uh, state machines, and complexity. Uh, and, and hopefully, they're at least they're, they're kind of on the right track. You also see this in sandboxes. So you know, sandboxes are a lot more common these days. Most modern smartphones uh, have some form of a, a sandbox, which is isolating individual pieces uh, against the, the rest of the system. You can see this in uh, applications as well. So you know, Adobe Reader has the, the, uh, their sandbox, which you know, isolates very different parts of the attack surface, such that you know, compromise of a single thing uh, may not uh, give you compromise of the entire application. Uh, Chrome has the same very model, right? Uh, everything uses namespaces. There's uh, some interesting IPC mechanisms, the way that they have uh, added seccomp to, to the uh, um, the system is much more secure than it was before when we didn't have sandboxes in our, our browsers. You also even do this on a very basic level of your application, right? You don't write one big main function that has everything. Uh, you want to be able to catch things. You want to be able to handle errors clearly. And so you've got functions. So this is, this, uh, you know, maybe this isn't your legacy application. Maybe it doesn't look like this with a, you know, a steering wheel and things. but. Maybe it feels like this when you're trying to add things onto it or work with it. Uh, but unfortunately, there's a number of things to consider. So your, your sales team, this is kind of how they might feel about the, the legacy app, right? It's bringing in money. It's not necessarily costing a ton of additional development time. I'm sorry if you're, you're in sales and you're in the room. Uh, but really, you know, they love the monolith. They might not understand it, but they love it. And I think this is what developers mostly see, right? It's a very complicated balancing act. It's hard to add things on top of it without risking something, breaking underneath it. Uh, so it's a tricky thing to do. This uh, is when you're in ops. You might see this as the, as the legacy application. You know, it, it can be a, a kind of a giant pile of shit, but you've got to take care of it. Uh, and that's unfortunate. 
uh, you know, as attackers, often this is what we see, right? Lots of attack surface, lots of potential problems, probably not updated very often uh, because it's a difficult thing to do. And I will tell you that as an attacker, we love the dinosaur. So before we get into some, some more about microservices, I wanted to briefly run through some, some security principles. So really, I think these help frame when you're thinking about a new architecture, thinking about these principles uh, can really help. So defense in depth, obviously, layering your defenses, preventing very minimal attack surfaces, and then hardening those attack surfaces that you have to present. Uh, you know, everyone uses a, a, the, uh, the kind of example of a castle, but obviously, if you, if you have a modern, you know, kind of battleship, it has this same layered defense, right? You've got airplanes that you can project, you've got missiles at a certain range, then you've got guns when it gets closer. And monolithic applications make defense in depth more difficult because you've got a larger thing to worry about all kind of in one, two, or three big pieces versus lots of very specific things uh, where you can implement least privilege. There's also the principle of least privilege, which you know, everyone always mentions, oh, just avoid running as root. That's least privilege. But really, it's a lot much more deeper of a concept is that, you know, only granting access to what something needs or only giving files to what something needs or network access to what something actually needs. You know, everyone, if you go into a, a, a whiteboard diagram of somebody's application, they usually draw, you know, one or two lines between things. But in reality, it's a lot more lines and it's a lot um, less, uh, clear than what is usually understood as the model. Uh, I also like to say that there's this principle of least surprise, which people mostly associate with kind of UX design and things. But really, I think it should be sane defaults and uh, you know, kind of things that are isolated by trust, such that you're not surprised when something is uh, accessible um, to everything. That, you know, that shouldn't be the case. There's the principle of least access. And that shows us that, you know, uh, Information and connections need to, are on a need-to-know basis, uh, and you know there's definitely a lot of history in distributing uh, information in a secure way and not sharing things that you don't need to share, such that a compromise at a lower level doesn't compromise the people at the top. So really, least is common to all of these kind of principles, and uh, while I think that microservices still have some complexity because of the overall system they still reduce it because each individual component can be kind of zoomed in on and it should be very clear what are the connection requirements, what are the data requirements, what are the access requirements. So as kind of a, an overall model, you know, we want to kind of establish what our trust boundaries are. We want to identify and minimize our, our attack services. We want to reduce the scope and then we want to layer the protections as many as we can. So let's compare and comp contrast the models. So, you know, some upsides of monolithic stuff is that it's really a known known, right? It, it's been a lot around in the industry, whether, uh, you know, you call it a three-tier architecture or you call it, um, you know, service-oriented but not minimal. Uh, and in some ways, you know, it's very simple. The, there's a lot of existing knowledge about it. Some of the downsides is that, you know, a compromise of one piece can often mean the compromise of one or more additional pieces. Uh, obviously, that's bad. It also has problems with, uh, you know, authentication requirements or access requirements being very global in scope. So, you know, if, if you have a large application that needs to talk to all kinds of different third-party services and AWS and so on and so forth, you usually end up having to have some giant massive credentials file. And if that's ever compromised, it compromises all those credentials, even if just one single component was the, uh, the thing that they were after. And really, you know, at the end of the day, security is hard to tailor to a very large uh, piece of software or a, a few large services. So upsides of microservices, we talked about this, you know, Unix model is, is very, uh, works well. You know, when you have highly application-specific containers, you can have highly application-specific security, uh, and that's a big win. It also helps you build kind of a, a trusted computing base where you've got some set level of properties about your containers or about your systems, and you can then use that across uh, more than one uh, architecture. Other upsides is that it, it helps uh, create a model of least privilege, and you can reduce attack services a lot because you actually not only understand clearly what the access requirements are, where your data is stored, and what uh, you know encryption is happening, and so forth. Uh, but you can easily 
um, control those as well. And then finally, it's much easier to patch. So if you have a very large application with lots of moving pieces, it can be tricky to upgrade that whole thing, let's say if there's a vulnerability in a library that's core that you use, uh, or there's some uh, problem you, you want to push out a new version. Uh, the slower that process is, the more at risk you're going to be. Some of the downsides of microservices, right, they're, they're not a magic bullet, is that they're not necessarily well defined. You know, what is microservices can be a lots of different things. It also requires a really good understanding of your application. So you can't take something uh, huge, if you just pack it into a container and slap a REST API on it, th that's not really microservices, right? You know, you need to understand all the different parts of the application, how they fit together, uh, what requirements are needed for access uh, in order to really do it correctly, I would say. Um, it also re might require some kind of operational or culture changes, right? If you listen to, uh, you know, Adrian or, uh, or uh, Martin Fowler or any of the other people who talked a ton about microservices, you know, it's not necessarily just using containers and putting some small pieces of code in them. It's a whole kind of dev organizational change uh, that honestly I don't, I don't know a ton about, but uh, I wanted to bring up. But lastly, kind of the, the one other downside that I wanted to mention that, that I would say uh, as a security person is kind of unique for me to, to raise as a problem, but uh, this idea of having dumb pipes but smart applications, uh, those dumb pipes can, can really cause a lot of problems if you have a compromise at a lower level. Uh, and, and we'll talk about this a little bit more. So let's explore some, some kind of real world uh, impacts here. So, you know, let's say that you have a hypothetical application that's vulnerable to some kind of what I would call, you know, worst case scenario in a, a common web application, which is probably remote code execution uh, or a local file read uh, or something like that. So we have our, our little architecture here with our attacker uh, and our firewall and our cloud and so forth. And, you know, we've got this large maybe set of virtual machines. Uh, we've got, a, you know, some front-end applications. We've got some back-end applications. And uh, maybe they're in containers yet already. Maybe they're in VMs. Maybe they're whole physical machines. But really what it ends up being is when you look at the details is there's strange interactions between these pieces. Uh, maybe there's limits that exist. Maybe there aren't. Maybe there's indirect limits. Uh, you know, I, I can make a, I can't connect the database uh, directly, but I can query something that then calls the database, and if there's SQL injection in that or, or something like that, you can then read files from the database, and so it kind of goes from there um, and so forth. And usually in reality it ends up being that there's another set of servers that's internal that then have other third parties calling into them, and it becomes more complicated. And if one piece is, is compromised, uh, that usually uh, can often lead to other Code or, code or date or, or, or code or data or credentials or whatever else being, being compromised. So, you know, this is DockerCon. Uh, we're going to think about splitting up those into, into containers, breaking those out. And, you know, once we do that, some of the communication become a, can become a, a bit more clear. We can have a little bit well, more well-defined boundaries between what needs to talk to what and how it authenticates. And really it lets us put lots of firewalls or, or lots of uh, gates essentially, whether that's authorization or authentication uh, or actual you know, IP tables uh, between different services and uh, really helps us uh, add some internal security. But because this is microservices, we want to break that backend application up into again, multiple subcomponents of that. That gives us more specialization, that gives us more tailored security, uh, and, and, and um, if we can't uh, contain the old stuff, we can at least wrap it with an API and try to make it as small as possible. This lets us limit compromises, which is the, you know, kind of the whole point, where even if this uh, you know, legacy backend server has some vulnerability that somebody finds, uh, it doesn't let them, you know, make arbitrary calls to different parts of the application. Uh, it doesn't let them read arbitrary files that they don't need because uh, they're not on the same box or they're not within the same container uh, as those other, the other portions. And really kind of lets us uh, take the sandbox model from programming 
and make a sandbox for applications, but each, instead of having each kind of function or, or, or uh, kind of subprocess of our, our application sandbox, we've got a subprocess or application uh, sandbox around our microservice. So I mentioned earlier about dumb pipes. And uh, you know, the, the OSI model is a great way to keep in mind about network security, where security and other things aren't necessarily guaranteed uh, at the lower, la la lower layers. So if we only are doing layer seven authentication, which is, is an often uh, a thing that's advocated in microservices, if we're only doing layer, layer seven auth, we basically are exposing all these lower level uh, parts of the um, connection stack. You're also exposing at, at some basic level the uh, web server itself, right? So you know you've got some whether however you're doing authentication, whether that's a header or username password or, or something like that. Uh, you've got some level of access to that web server. If there was a, a basic flaw um, in that attack service that you're exposing, it may allow somebody who doesn't have access to then get access. If we do a low, if we do authentication uh, at a lower level, so let's say we're using client certificates with TLS. We've protected a whole lot of parts of the application without ever actually having to do a lot of work. So uh, you know, you need that client certificate in order to actually create a connection in the first place. You can't talk to the web server at all. There, are, there's no vulnerability, and you know, let's say that uh, there's an issue with found with you know JWT uh, that can't be exploited if you're using client certificates because it's at a low, uh, an above layer. And really, you know, at the end of the day, speed is also no longer a concern. Um, you know, I, I don't, uh, especially with you know AES instructions and, and so forth. Uh, TLS is, is super fast, and you can even go lower, right? You can do IPsec uh, and uh, and so forth. And I'm not necessarily uh, arguing that um, authentication should only happen uh, at layer three or or four or five uh, or so forth, but that if you can add it at a, the network layer, do so, and also add it at layer seven, and there's some more defense in depth. One way to think about this as well is, what is your attack service of uh, you know, arbitrary SSL VPN sitting out there on the network? Uh, you know, if you're using username and password auth, you've got the, you're exposing the web application that's handling that. You're exposing the username and password credentials. You're exposing uh, uh, potential attacks there with the web server uh, and so forth. Uh, if you're using you know, client certificates, then it's uh, quite a bit uh, more difficult to, to do attacks that way. Um, and then all the way down, you know, if you're using IPsec and you have only keys, obviously the attack service is much smaller and, and so forth. Uh, if we think about it in terms of encryption, uh, you know, layer seven encryption, uh, you know, in some ways is, is TLS is that. Is that. Um, but a lot of times if you think about it, application level encryption, that would be like encrypting your, uh, just the payloads of HTTP or something. Uh, versus if you were doing encryption at, at, at uh, TLS, there's a lot more that's hidden there. There's a lot more that's protected, uh, that is authenticated, and so forth. So you know, I, I think it's important to say that layer seven authentication should be required, obviously, uh, but that less than layer seven authentication is highly desirable. And that when you're thinking about designing your microservices, or even in your current system, you know, uh, that authentication and authorization are two very different things. Uh, and that you know, if you have authentication, you kind of then need uh, transport security to protect that. And if you have transport security, you need to authenticate that transport security. So you know, if you're using TLS, you have to actually verify the certificates, which is uh, surprisingly uh, a common problem that people have. So I think it's also important to think about how containers. Uh, obviously, you know, if you're in the room, you probably like containers in some form or another. How those map to microservices. So, you know, we have this idea of limited root capabilities. Now, in kind of a microservices model, we can develop kind of a capability-based security. Uh, same thing goes for network namespaces. So, in network namespaces, uh, you know, can can isolate different applications. It's it's very you know difficult, if not impossible, to talk to each other uh, if you're not in the same namespace. Uh, or have some other layer routing uh, setup, but for uh, for microservices, you know, uh, overlay networks and software-defined networking are are really uh, you know kind of 
being helped along and, and pushed uh, these days by containers, but also that uh, they can help implement that lower levels of authentication or uh, basic network security back onto your dumb pipes. So you might have dumb pipes at the very, very lowest level, but then you can, you can still have some level of, of access control at the network level by using software-defined networking. And then finally, the, the way that the, the third kind of way that containers map to microservices is that you know, when you have this model of one app per container, which is great for lots of different reasons, including security, now you kind of have this one core function per application, uh, and that can really help for a lot of those same security reasons. So there's a lot of different types of attacks that are, uh, can be done against container or container systems. I, I go over a lot of these kinds of things in, in my white paper. But the point of some of this is to, to kind of prune the attack tree backwards. So uh, you know, if we have an application attack, there's a lot of different things that we can use to defend from that, right? We have the container itself. We've got capabilities. Uh, we can have you know, different uh, bind mount flags to, to limit things. We have manager access control. The whole container could be read only. Um, and so forth. Uh, you know, if we have a system call uh, related kernel exploit, we've got seccomp filtering to try to prevent that. Um, same thing goes if you know, we have a, a compromised kernel or a compromised host. Let's say that there's a Docker vulnerability that lets somebody escape. Well, then we go back to that isolation based on trust, network security hardening, uh, least privilege, least access as a model that helps limit that compromise to that, that one area. So let's talk about microservices in, in, in Docker and, and Run C. So why Docker Run C? I shouldn't really have to go into this because obviously you're here in this room, uh, so I'll skip it. Uh, why would you use Run C for microservices? Well, it's lightweight, it's minimal, it's lib container, so those are all wins. Why wouldn't you want to use it? Well, it's lightweight, it's minimal, uh, and so it requires a bit more manual involvement, right? Part of what, why Docker is, Docker is so popular is because it's also very easy. Uh, you know, LXC was around for a few years before Docker came along, and LXC is still kind of not as popular uh, for, for many reasons. So it is minimal. You will have to do some more manual uh, tracking down of JSON errors, uh, missing commas, and so forth. Uh, which is painful. Um, I also want to point out that right now, at least, uh, Run C by default, um, AppArmor is not a default build tag. So if you're building Run C uh, and kind of following the, the basics, um, you won't have any uh, manager access control at AppArmor, which is, is on by default in Docker. Uh, and the user namespace support is enabled by default, which is great in Run C, but it's not enabled by default. So just like Docker, you ha really have to turn that on. It's a very good security addition. So if we're thinking about microservices, security really starts with the base operating system. So whether you want to use a minimal distro like CoreOS, Rancher OS, uh, something smaller, or you want to use plain old Ubuntu server, uh, or you want to use something like Clear Linux, or even uh, you, you want to go crazy and use a unikernel, uh, really, you know, the base OS is, is a good starting point for understanding where the security of your containers and your applications uh, actually is. So there's a lot of Linux, uh, minimal Linux distributions that are intended for running containers. Um, I'm not really going to explore these. Uh, it's somewhat of a complicated topic. Um, but you know, uh, Alpine has gained a lot of traction lately, especially by people uh, such as Docker um, kind of helping. Uh, Rancher OS is, is also very cool. Uh, I still enjoy that when I Google Rancher OS, I get a picture of my, my favorite breakfast. So, Security really does start with the base OS, but it's important when you're evaluating what are these minimal container distributions you're going to use, um, how they handle different security things. So there, it, you know, Linux isn't the same everywhere. Uh, so you have to think about how do they handle updates. If there's an update uh, needed in a, in a package, am I going to have to build that myself, or you know, are they going to push an update for me? Uh, how big is their team of people who do that? If it's on a weekend, is somebody actually involved? Uh, or am I just going to have to wait till Monday or, or do it myself? Uh, you know, what, what flags are they using when they're compiling their binary packages, right? There's compile time protections against memory corruption and other, other things that we can use that are very good uh, things for defense in depth against uh, different vulnerabilities and native code. What, what are they using for their, their, their packages that I'm installing? Um, what security faults do they have for, for mandatory access control? 
what you know default kernel things that they have they enabled or disabled uh, or built the kernel with that I that I'm installing, and also things like sys control settings, which um, can can also add some defense in depth. So if you want to, obviously, you know, you can, uh, I think this is somewhat of a lost art, but you can build your own kernel, right? Make menu config is probably something that most people in this room uh, haven't typed in a long time. I know I haven't typed it in a long time. Uh, but it's, it's something that is a very good thing to do if you're thinking about building a hardened platform to, to use as your base system. Uh, there's a whole lot of things that are enabled by default that you don't need. Uh, and that's really the, one of the points of this. So, but if we're going to talk about minimal containers, uh, you know, we don't want to just shrink the host system down. We also want to shrink the container itself, right? If we have got a, a you know, big, uh, if we're pulling in three or four Docker files that then pull in three or four hundred megabytes of extra stuff uh, to just one, run one application, the odds are that it doesn't actually need all those things. So if you look at some kind of, uh, I would say, you know, gold standard uh, container images such as, you know, that are, that are maintained by, by uh, as part of the Docker library, things like Redis and Mongo and Node, those things, you know, if you look in their Docker file, they actually use, you know, from Debian and Jesse or from Debian and Wheezy and so forth. So if we look at, you know, what, what actually is from Debian and Jesse. So if you look at that, the Docker file is just this. So from scratch, which is an empty Docker file, uh, you know, add the root of S into the Docker, into the Docker image. Uh, and that's it. So if we look at that, if that root of S images, if you extract that and look at the, the data, that's actually just 137 megabytes. So Debian Jesse is pretty awesome for, for being minimal. So what about, uh, you know, from Debian Wheezy, 97 megabytes. So again, uh, very minimal. So you might be thinking, well, what about, uh, you know, Jenkins or, or Elasticsearch or one of these other things that uses Java, you know, isn't that going to be larger? Well, they, it seems like they've done a pretty good job, and most of them use from Debian and Jesse, uh, or, or in some cases, something even smaller. But I would go to say that, you know, these aren't really minimal enough. It, you know, if we're being micro, uh, you know, when you, were, when you use apt-get to install two or three packages or five or ten packages that your app needs in your Docker file, even if you're using from Debian and Jesse, you're going to pull in a whole bunch of extra stuff that you don't need. Uh, you know, including even, even without installing anything at all, Debian and Jesse comes with Perl. So if you're thinking about it from an attacker's perspective, if you compromise that container, uh, the number of things you can do with Perl to try to move around the environment or create a reverse shell or do other things, uh, Perl is all you need, um, even if it's super painful to, to write any code in. Um, <laughs> And also, by having a larger image, it gives you a lot more, you need a lot more patching. Uh, you need a lot, you have a lot, you need more disk space. You have more attack surface. You have more, you know, post-exploitation utilities uh, that are helpful for attackers when they're doing things like drive-by um, uh, drive attacks where they download a script and it runs, you know, sbin netcat and it runs wget and other things. If those utilities don't exist at all, that's just going to, that's just going to fall on its face. And so you're, you're raising the bar of the attacker quite a bit by having a very minimal container. So the general idea for Docker minimal containers is, you know, again, similar to Debian and Jesse, uh, you know, from scratch, add your stuff, uh, run your stuff. In run C, it's the same thing. Uh, you know, create your rootfs directory, put your stuff in that, uh, generate the spec file, and run. The reality is a little bit more tricky where, you know, uh, you, you want to figure out what your program needs. So, you know, if we're talking about just a simple binary uh, application here, we've got, you know, uh, assuming you're, you're not statically compiling it, you've got LDD to figure out what dynamic libraries you need. You create the right directories. Uh, you copy those uh, uh, libraries into the rootfs, and then you, you run it. Um, Usually you have to do a little bit of finger crossing depending on the complexity of the app just because some of those libraries then reference other libraries. Uh, but really it doesn't end up being super complicated. And you'd be surprised how small a container you can actually create. So uh, I recently, um, admittedly, became a, a pretty big fan of Go. And I'm not also the first person to talk about minimal containers, especially with Go. So there's two great articles that, that talk about um, minimal containers with Go. One advantage of using Go, obviously, apart from Go itself, is that 
if you write your code in pure Go, it actually creates a static executable. So you can actually have just a single binary uh, in your Docker container. So obviously, that, that's about as minimal as it gets. If we take the Golang wiki server example uh, as kind of our hypothetical microservice that we're going to, to, to do a POC for, and even if we compile it, uh, it's not a native, it, it doesn't, uh, it's not purely Go, so it will actually uh, include um, libpthread, and, and so you need to, to uh, copy some libraries in. But even if you copy those libraries in, uh, you know, assuming you uh, have a very simple application, you're still only talking about a 7.3 megabyte uh, container, which has nothing extra at all. Uh, if you take a bit more complex application, such as Nginx, you put that in Docker, you assume you've got maybe a couple configuration files, a couple of directories, uh, maybe this is an API router, maybe it's a, uh, you know, a simple static um, page. Uh, how small is that? Well, 15 megabytes. So smart guy said, you know, make things as simple as possible, but not any simpler. So now if we kind of revisit where we are. So we, we've got our minimal hardened OS. We've got our minimal hardened, hopefully, kernel. We've got our minimally hardened, hopefully, rootFS, right? Only what it needs. I can mount most of it read-only and so forth. Uh, how do we add more security, right? This is high security in microservices, not just secure microservices. So one way to do that is with mandatory access control. So if you jump back to 1998, this paper, uh, the, inevitability of, the Inevitability of Failure, Flawed Assumptions in the Modern Computing Environment, really uh, came out um, from the NSA uh, advocating for the idea of mandatory access control in high security environments. Um, you know, it, they obviously went on to this to, to develop SE Linux. So mandatory access control in Linux uh, comes in a number of different forms, but kind of the two primary ones that you'll see are AppArmor uh, on kind of Debian-based distributions and SE Linux on Red Hat-based distributions. Um, uh, modern, you know, other modern OSs have a mandatory access platform. Uh, you know, OSX has trusted BSD. Uh, Microsoft, in true Microsoft fashion, um, called it, um, uh, what are they called? Uh, mandatory integrity control, um, because, you know, they need to unvent something themselves. So mandatory access control in default Docker is enabled, uh, which is awesome. It actually uses the, most of the code uh, from the LXC policy. Um, with a couple of additions, but uh, it's enabled by default, but really it focuses on limiting the container from escaping to the host. That's the only thing it's doing. It's not limiting anything about your app within the container, uh, or uh, it's also very generic, right? It's intended to be, to work with any container um, that you could be running under Docker. So, the way that AppArmor profile kind of looks like is, uh, you know, let's say that we're going to pro write a profile for bash. It's a very simple example. But this basically says that uh, whenever I run bin bash, AppArmor is going to be automatically activated because I have this uh, profile which is named via a path. So when I run bin bash, it's going to, the only thing that's going to let me execute is bin cat. And then once I run bin cat, I can actually jump into a nested AppArmor profile which says the only thing that cat can do is read as he hosts. And that's it. That's, that's the only thing that everything else is going to be denied. Obviously, this is a simple example, but we get a lot of security by having this kind of a model where even if I'm root, uh, if this is an app armored process, I can't do other things. If we go back to that, that Golang wiki example, you, know, you might be thinking that a real world app armor profile uh, is also really is much more complicated, but in reality, this is something uh, this is something like all you would need, right? So you, you name your profile; it doesn't have to be a path-based name, uh, but you name it something like slash wiki. Um, you uh, allow the uh, TCP access with that network inet iStream. You allow it to load some libraries into memory, and then execute slash wiki, uh, and that's it. Um, when you use the I flag there on that bottom thing, that means inherit the profile. So in reality, that slash wiki would then be able to read those libraries as well. Um, but really, this is all you would need, and uh, that's all the application would be able to do. So the way that most, uh, the, the kind of easiest way to generate AppArmor profiles is use AAGenProf. So it's, a, it's kind of a um, 
a way to profile the application by putting what, uh, what the, what, what's called the, uh, the profile in what's called complain mode. So what that essentially means is you um, deny everything by default, but just log. And so you log all these things, uh, and it creates a, helps you create a profile that then you can then switch into mandatory mode. Now something that to keep in mind with this is that you have to actually use the application to profile it correctly. So this is a good place to you know, run unit tests, run automated tests, run it for um, a week uh, with a whole bunch of uh, users on it to generate every possible edge case um, and then switch it to enforcing. And hopefully you also do some review to make sure that you know, there's some functionality in there that you actually want to allow uh, by default. So some, some common mistakes or problems with our Rumber obviously are you know, having to provide too much access, uh, um, having to deal with wild cards, uh, and, and it, at the end of the day, it's a path-based ba path ACL, whereas um, SE Linux is a bit more complicated. But the path-based also makes it easy to use, which is, is why it's, it's more popular. So some other ways to do it, uh, Jesse Frizzell, obviously uh, popular in the container world, wrote Bane, which is a kind of a, a wrapper uh, language around profiles that makes it a bit easier to write. Um, it's uh, you know she, she named it Bane on purpose uh, because they were they were painful to to interact with. You also can uh, can do what's called full system policy. So you essentially put your app armor profiles into your um, init ramfs, and then your entire uh, um, distribution from the kernel on down, every single thing that gets executed or is required to have an app armor profile. Um, this obviously is, is, it can be fairly difficult to implement, but it also gives you complete um, kind of uh, accountability. And then w one final thing to keep in mind with app armor is avoiding blacklists. So the, it is possible to use deny flags on certain things, but that uh, is not a good model, right? It's the same thing as, as any other deny list. You know, you want to have allow only whitelists. Uh, some, some final AppArmor profile gotchas. So the AppArmor profiles actually have to be loaded by AppArmor first. Uh, and so, uh, you know, in the configuration files, you reference what the AppArmor profile name is, but you have to have that loaded in place. Uh, you can't just have it, a f it's not just pointing to a file or something. Um, some of the abstractions might be more verbose than you like. So a lot of times you'll have AppArmor profile, which includes uh, abstractions base or something. That essentially just lets you read any library from any directory under slash lib or something. Uh, that could have unintended consequences uh, if you don't keep it in mind. Um, and finally, you know, the profiling process, process isn't perfect. So you may want to you know, switch to enforcing mode, but then uh, keep a close eye on logs to make sure that you're not denying you know, legitimate access. So we mentioned seccomp BPF. But why is that important? So seccomp exists purely to limit the attack service of the kernel. Setcomp itself is not a sandbox. Uh, it's very clear, even in the patch uh, that, they, that Google originally submitted, that um, makes it you know, explicit that it's not a sandbox. But it's really about reducing the attack surface, because the attack surface on a kernel is, is huge. So there is a default profile in Setcomp, uh, or in Docker uh, post 1.10, which is really awesome to see. Um, and um, the general pseudocode of the way that seccomp works is uh, seccomp, the BPF is Berkeley packet filter. So you think of BPF uh, really being implemented in TCP dump usually. Uh, but in this case, it's actually being implemented in the kernel to uh, provide for a, a dynamic filter of what to do for certain syscalls. And the way that this general pseudocode works is, if you look at a profile closely, usually what it does is check the architecture. And the reason why it checks the architecture is because um, syscall numbers are architecture dependent. And so if you're using setcomp on ARM, it's going to be different than setcomp on x86-64. Usually it will check the architecture, get a system call, and then it will either deny or allow that system call. Hopefully it will allow because you're using a whitelist model, not a blacklist. And then in the kind of ending uh, kind of catch-all or default case is either to um, kill the process, to trap the process and send a SIGSYS to trace the process, which I'll talk about, uh, or to allow. But why, why do we want custom profiles, right? If Docker has it by default, why do I need to put myself through the pain of uh, 
of generating uh, another whitelist? Well, that's because the default uh, setcom profile permits 300 syscalls. And if we're thinking about defense in depth and we're thinking about least access, the average, um, even the web application, probably only needs 30 to 50. Uh, or if we're thinking about a microservice, the, ab the average kind of application probably only needs maybe 10 to 20 system calls uh, if we're minimal. And so we want to practice least privilege. We want to cut that down in case that there's a, you know, a kernel exploit in uh, one of the permitted sets. So the way that you would come up with a set comp whitelist, there's a number of different kind of ideas around how to do this. I don't think there's a kind of best practice. Uh, it kind of depends on how you're going to generate it, uh, what you're going to do, and what tools you have, uh, and you know, what, how much time you have. So SetCom profiles using strace is kind of the first go-to. If you look at a lot of demos, you know, strace is pretty much the thing that they're going to, to mention. So strace uses uh, ptrace under the covers, uh, which is essentially you know, the same thing that GDB uses. Um, but some reasons why you might not want to use strace is that strange timing of bugs can, strange timing bugs can sometimes occur, whether you're, you're dealing with a large um, application with lots of different threads interacting, uh, that can be problematic. Um, and also, some programs are, don't uh, react friendly to being traced. Uh, you know, if you've got a whole bunch of um, Java things and there's you know, 60 different threads and uh, you know, lots of complex stuff going back and forth, it can be tricky to figure out and even for strace to, to follow all everything and, and manage it correctly and count all those syscalls and so forth. So the way that this you know, typically works is you run strace on whatever application you're going to be running in your container. You can see the list of system calls there and all the arguments, but really all you care about is what those system calls are. Uh, a lot of examples we use strace dash c, which essentially just, it, all it does is count the system calls that are made and then give you a list at the end. Um, but that will actually miss a few, uh, so there's a couple of caveats with, with using that. The next way to do it uh, is, is with sysdig. So sysdig is a super cool um, kernel module. Uh, it's a little unfortunate that it's a kernel module, but part of the power that it comes from is that fact that, that it is a kernel module. Um, it can do a ton of really cool stuff. I think they even have a booth here um, where they can, they can show it off. But the way that this would work for setcomp is, uh, you know, the, the first example that there just uh, is kind of a, a POC for Sysdig itself. It says, you know, show me all the open system calls for any process named Nginx. Uh, to take that further, you can use Sysdig-p uh, and print the system call for any process name engine X. Uh, and then obviously, you know, create your sorted list and uh, send that to a text file. And there's your basic, um, basic whitelist. Uh, there's also audit D. So audit D, you know, uh, on Linux is very nice for auditing. Um, but really it's not ideal for generating system call uh, lists. It is ideal for, for monitoring uh, set comp profiles and set comp uh, after you've got your, your profiles built um, for, for either a failure case, which hopefully is just that you, you didn't whitelist the right thing and not that the application process is compromised. Uh, but it's not ideal for, for actually creating um, lists. And kind of the, the fourth method is to actually create set comp profiles by using set comp itself. Uh, and this is kind of more of the, the advanced method. So uh, Keys Cook and, and Will Drury, who are the original authors of, uh, Will being the original author of, of the setcomp BPF patch, have a, a good example there if you want to explore setcomp itself and kind of going from scratch of what it looks like and how it works, uh, there's that link there. But the way that they implemented the tracing and developing a, an, um, uh, a profile is by using uh, setcomp return trap, which essentially just sends a signal and as soon as it hits a system call that isn't in the allow list, uh, rather than killing the process. But the process still dies. One better way to use is uh, to use return trace. And the reason why we do that is because all of the, uh, apart from allow and, and um, trace, all the other error return modes will block the system call and then die. Um, they don't let you keep going. So it's hard to build a profile if you know, you, you start out with no system calls or, or five system calls and you hit six, okay, it's dead. Try it again. Seven, okay, it's dead. And then th that's, that's painful. So the way that the general methodology is, is to use uh, setcomp itself. So the default, you set the default action to setcomp return trace. Uh, 
And then if you're using ptrace, uh, there's a special ptrace flag you can use which will trace all set comp calls. And then once you uh, have that information, you can log that uh, and repeat until you don't have any soft failures or your training is done. So I, I wrote kind of a POC for this. Um, which uh, essentially just lets you do set comp trace and it lists out, you know, uh, right now just to, to send it out, but it would list out, you know, what things it would be blocking. So then you can go back and tweak that list of allowed system calls, run it again and see if you have any that, that would be blocked as you're doing those, that. Um, if you're interested in, in a kind of probably much cleaner code and code that's actually live right now, um, the subgraph OS team, which uh, has a very cool distribution focused on security, uh, they have a Golang based uh, libsec comp, lib comp um, tracing code uh, that you can find in their, in their GitHub. So general set comp pit files. So we mentioned that profiles are based on architecture. That's uh, a problematic. Uh, also profiles are very fragile. So you know, you're, li you're specifically limiting the system calls that can be made. If you're crazy, you're also limiting the arguments those syscalls can make. But if you update a library or you update part of your application or something else, you might include another system call that needs to be whitelisted. So that's something to be aware of. So setcomp in Docker, uh, it's a very, uh, you know, fairly easy way to change the default profile to something specific. You know, you, you have a <coughs> your default action there and your, uh, your system calls that you want to allow. Same thing for run C, it actually uses the same exact um, syntax, which is nice. Um, but when you're dealing with SecOmp, remember it's not a, it's not a sandbox. Uh, if you want to build this into your own application, you don't have to necessarily use uh, SecOmp in run C, you could use SecOmp directly. Um, and uh, there are some nice Go bindings for libsecomp now. Uh, but always, you know, avoid blacklists, there's a number of caveats there. Um, as well as uh, always den denying ptrace in your setcomp playlist because ptrace can be used to, to bypass setcomp. Um, some follow-ups as well. So setcomp, uh, you know, obviously we have that. We go, we go from a list of system calls to kind of a JSON format. Um, there's a nice uh, little script here which will spit that out. And you can always confirm that your process is actually setcomp uh, enabled um, by looking in um, proc the PID of your process uh, status for, for number two there. So we've got our hardened OS, we've got our hardened kernel, we've got our hardened rootFS, we've got our specific app armor, we've got our specific setcomp whitelist. I think that's fairly high security. So in general recommendations, so always enable the newer user namespace, right? It's awesome that we have one dot, that in 1.10, but it's not enabled by default. So enable the, the user namespace, that's, that's uh, critical. Uh, use app armor specific policy if possible. Use a setcomp specific policy if possible. Um, don't forget to harden your host system that you're running containers on. Always restrict the host access if you can. And um, always remember, uh, you know, container security for, for the network. So either that's cross container uh, to prevent um, cross container compromise or um, container to orchestration or container to uh, whatever, else, whatever else it may be. Uh, high security for run C, uh, you know, configuring the user namespaces, enabling and using app armor, uh, and the same for, for Docker. So there's also this problem of managing secrets. And I would like to uh, have a talk entirely on this topic, but it's also highly different depending on what the secrets are, what the infrastructure is, and so forth. But in general, uh, there's a number of things to keep in mind. So a lot of times people will say to use environment variables, and that's very, uh, there, there's advantages to using environment variables, but one of the disadvantages that, that I've seen personally in doing pen tests against container environments is because environment variables can have a tend to leak down into lower parts of the application that you might not have intended them. And the way then that, the reason that is, because often you passing the environment variable down uh, as it goes. So you might start out with, you know, AWS access key as an environment variable, but that might end up in a, some shell script that's at a lower level uh, and it could have access to that. Um, one other way to, to, to do about it is to, you know, have a temporary bind mount where you can kind of inject secrets and then disconnect. Um, and obviously, you know, exploring real container man uh, secret management systems like Vault and KeyWiz 
which are, are quite hardcore and very awesome. With microservices, there's also the idea of immutable containers. So this is a whole other topic that, that I don't really, really go into, but I think it really extends the idea of uh, the basic idea that operating systems have of non-executable memory pages, but extending that into containers. So you have containers which are purely read-only, um, which are hard to compromise, and then you have containers that are data read and write specific uh, and extend that, that idea. Because it's nothing more frustrating than trying to you know, compromise an application when you can't write to the disk at all. Uh, you can't, the one place you can write to is mounted, no execs, so you can't execute code from there, and so forth. Um, on the network side, uh, use TLS. Use it everywhere. It's 2016. Data should be encrypted. Uh, just do it, right? Um, even if you have uh, you know, your internal network, um, if you uh, have two things that are next to each other on the same box, I would argue that you even should use TLS between those. Um, you might call that overkill, but if you ever separate those out, you have this underlying platform of security that you can trust that has authentication and encryption that you don't need to worry about, oh, you know, oh, we need to wrap that in TLS. It's just, it's TLS all the time everywhere. Um, you know, if you want dumb pipes, that's, that's great. There's a lot of reasons to do that these days. But look into using software-defined networking and look into using overlay networks to still add some basic network security access controls uh, around your containers. Some other recommendations are just think about having a specification for your microservice. And that specification really should document what are the threat models for that application. What are the things it's trying, what, are the, what is the data that goes through it? What pieces does it need to talk to within the rest of the environment? Uh, and then finally, um, collecting and keeping logs is huge, right? These days, uh, if you look at any kind of post-compromise, post-environment, you know, incident response, the first thing that person is going to ask for, access for is, is logs. So keep logs, you know, storage is cheap. Uh, keep them for as long as you can. Collect them centrally. Um, and if you're interested in these kinds of security topics uh, in a bit more depth, uh, I, you, know, you should check out my, my white paper. It um, has more info. I think we're pretty much out of time. Are there any questions? Yeah, right there. Yeah, sure. I can repeat it for you if you want. Environmental variables as a way to get secrets in. It, it's not ideal, but it's a way. Um, a trick I came up with is I put a decryption key in my image and then I inject encrypted environmental variables. And then with my startup script, it, if it's the right image, right, it pulls, the decry it uses the decryption key to decrypt my environmental variables and write them to a file, which I know, like I use Docker Cloud HA proxy, and having a file or environmental variable is how you get SSL certs in. So having that as a technique um, at least keeps it out of the logs. So if yeah. I have a log dump or something, you know. Yeah, log, log exposure of environment variables is another factor. So uh, yeah, encrypting it is a trick. OK, thanks. Uh, it's, it's a pinned tweet on my page. You can also email me, and I'll send it to you. Uh, or if you go to nccgroup.trust, you should be able to find it under our white papers or, or research. Thanks.